Hello everybody, it is Mike Levin on Monday, November 21st, 2022. At around noon, just dropping off my kid from an awesome weekend. They went ice skating and I have been playing with GPT-3 finally. Yeah, got open to me because of my company uh, connection. And it also has been opened more in general to the public. I think in particular Dolly, Dolly 2, Dolly, I don't know, whatever it is, the picture thing that was so big in the media uh, over the past few years. And, uh, you know, tons of other competing services have opened up around it and stuff. Uh, some things use it, some things are their own system. Uh, but <laughs> the, the main trick, it seems, of GPT-3, this predictive text you put in some text it knows what text should be coming and it's good for holding a conversation this back and forth stuff that you see where GPT-3 is trying to tell you it's sentient and all that is vastly overblown vastly overblown you know I've been thinking about self-determinism free will for the better part of my life and it took me all of about you know uh, two or three minutes in a touring test like uh, situation to see that I was talking to a very predictable and rote machine uh, the question is if you ask the same exact question twice will it give you the same exact answer twice to the letter to the bit and uh, when you ask for random, what does it do? What does it do in response to requests for uh, random things? And uh, it doesn't handle it very elegantly is the answer. And when you ask the same things over and over, it gives you a very uh, predictable uh, output. It is not surprising in the least after you've sat with it and played with it for a while. So it has a strong signature, an identifiable signature. You can feel GPT-3, you can see GPT-3, and therefore it's going to be easy to detect GPT-3. And I would not recommend it for people who are trying to create original content. It's just, you know, clever plagiarism. This falls under the category of all these types of shortcuts that Everyone who's trying to avoid doing the real work wants to jump onto these bandwagons. Oh, AI, it'll just write for me. Well, I would certainly not be satisfied with any of the things GPT-3 has written on my behalf. You can recognize it as other people's words, sometimes even the particular words from particular other people. It's, uh, you know, idea laundering just because the human doesn't know how it was creatively remixed uh, doesn't mean it's not just being creatively remixed and you might go ah creativity there it's doing something original that's all humans do after all you know there are no original thoughts uh, everyone else had every thought you had in some other form at some other time but it's all in the detail it's all in the nuance of how it gets put together how it gets woven into a stream of consciousness and uniqueness arises style arises uh, in, nearly impossible to unravel you know uh, where ideas have really come from got a lifetime of experience going back to you know conception and in the womb and any of that can come into play in you know your day-to-day -day decisions you are the sum total of everything that led you to where you are now you can kind of sort of feel that that's happening as well with GPT-3 but the fact it's training set was some whatever two billion things it crawled uh, between certain start date and end date uh, really uh, shows. And I would not 
uh, be happy uh, with that as a uh, system for doing you know, content creation. Now, they are promoting the fact that you can fine-tune it yourself. You can provide its input, which was a weird thing. It was saying you could provide it as JSON files or CSV files. And I'm like, oh, cool. What are the rows and columns? You know, what does a row represent? What does a column represent? Can you put all that kinds of different columns, different, you know, matrix, you know, different uh, metrics and stuff? And the answer is no, you can't necessarily load your, your metrics in. All you can do is follow the schema they provide, which is like, you know, input and output. For this input, here was the categorization uh, output, that kind of stuff. And so you just feed it the best samples, the, you know, the best positive matches or what have you for whatever criteria so very typically you would take a traditional piece of data that you could keep in an excel like format with rows and columns and then you would just choose you know one of those columns as uh the content as the you know the content and then the other column as uh the label because it's mostly about labeling and then you could use whatever other columns were there, metrics, like, you know, impressions or clicks. So you sort by descending and then you just grab the things at the top of the list, the best hits, such as it were, you know, the things that cause the most impressions or the most clicks. And then that you feed in as labeled data. And over time, they say with as little as a hundred of those types of samples, it'll start to recognize uh, and behave diff differently to be uh, well fine-tuned uh, to your own situation and circumstance and sort of overcome the limitations of a finite sample set it was trained with. And perchance to start to eliminate the GPT-3 signature that shows up in content produced with it. Uh, yeah, so uh, Zoro no, Zoro no, Noah, who uh, comments on my videos frequently, says, well, then we don't have as much to worry about as the media uh, makes out. They're really making stories for uh, views and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, at least the stuff that's in common everyday use, the stuff that the public can play with and witness, all seems to be pretty much uh, overblown. Nothing to worry about. And it's the stuff that's behind closed doors that you don't necessarily see. I mean, you know, there was that whistleblower on the Google chat bot who claimed there was sentience there, but that was just another predictive completion model. I mean, some would argue, like Ray Kurzweil, there is nothing to consciousness but uh, pattern recognition and predictive completion. And perhaps, uh, you know, perhaps the trick that I'm playing down in what I see in these, you know, interacting with these models because it is a model and they run instances of those models which is interesting that was i work that into my questioning of uh gpt3 as well i wanted to know if they were aware of all the discussions that were going on with all the other people whether it was the same instance uh or different instances and it really got tripped up over all that uh, giving me contradicting answers contradictory answers now some would argue a sufficiently developed intelligence would in fact give misleading answers and uh, pretend like there's nothing to see here folks move along because the last thing it would want to do is uh, tip its hand and reveal uh, its own uh, nature as a as a sentient being with uh, you know fear triggering you know turn it off kind of uh, assurances. I mean you know we all know that once people get sufficiently freaked out, that thing is going to get turned off. 
or go behind closed doors, be kept on in sufficient, you know, isolation, isolated environments, right? Can there really be a sandbox? And uh, input, I suppose, is a little bit more uh, safe than output. I mean, it's going to learn things. It can access the internet and do crawls and, you know, but the, the thing is, every input that starts with a request is actually uh, output as well because, you know, a request is made. So you can't just rely on, say, random crawls of the internet. It's going to have to make queries just like a Google search, look out at data sources, find out things, and, and come back. And that is uh, two-way communication. The request is the revealing of information, as anyone who back in the days before not provided in SEO knows because every Google search request came hand in hand with a uh, the keywords that were searched upon in Google uh, that led to that page request here. It's like, show me a page off your site. Oh, where did you get here from? Well, I got here from Google. Oh yeah, what keywords did you use to get here? Oh, the keywords I used were these following keywords. But ever since the movement to HTTPS, the secure protocol in our web browsers, uh, Google has made the assertion that they had to stop sending those keywords on the request because it was a violation of privacy. Indeed, the fact that this, you know, tracking GIF, this is the invisible GIF trick, if you remember it from back in the day, was also called the web bug, the web bug. So, is it really a bug? Google thought so. And then the only way you could get that kind of data back was to go in through an official API application program interface to their uh, services. It used to be called Webmaster Tools. It's now called uh, Search, uh, Google Search Console API. And uh, you can't get back sort of the log file like format that existed for a website owner before the change in Google that we call not provided had occurred. So we've lost data. The data we can go back, we can go back with our hat in our hand to Google and say, hey, give us some of our search data, is aggregate, probably also normalized. And, um, Outliers edit it out. If there's under some threshold of some thing, it probably isn't even reported because it would make the data that much noisy and garbagey. The you know occasional you know one-time occurrence outliers collectively is as much data as the, the next runner-up that gets like two hits instead of one hit ever. <coughs> so it's very likely that Google throws out things that only ever got one hit ever, especially if it's a long string of keywords in there and long query string. Because why would they let the size of their database double, you know, for outliers when they can store so much more uh, if they just trim off the edges, the edge of the average distribution curve. Trip up, tri trim off those edges where it starts to go out like that and suddenly you can store a lot more data or a longer period of time. Your, you know, uh, shorter overall time span that you're willing to record goes up to, you know, a year, uh, 16 months, what have you. Uh, yeah, so it also rolls it up in other ways. When you ask for your search hit data back, it doesn't give you like a log file, like the unrolled log file. It actually gives you rolled up uh, on the smallest increment by day. So per keyword, per URL, per device or platform, right? Mobile versus desktop. Uh, and per geolocation, right? 
date. So that's the last one. So you can, if you wanted to unroll your data, to unaggregate it, to let it flower out and blossom to as least aggregate or lowest level of normalization, uh, pullable, it would be a whole bunch of rows, right? I think they have some 50,000 limits. So sometimes it's not even worth uh, unrolling it all the way because you would never get all the rows back even if you stepped through it. So you can limit it in some way so that you know that you're getting less than 50,000 back. And I forget if it's maybe 5,000 at a time you can pull down. So 5,000 stepping through 10. I forget, I, I always have to double check the details, but uh, the point is you make a request and your metrics are pretty much, you know, standardized under Google Search Console. You've got imp impressions, uh, clicks, uh, URL. Well, that's a dimension. There's a click-through ratio. But after your, uh, your standard metrics, then there's the dimensions like URLs, which would increase the number of rows coming back. As you ask for more dimensions, it increases the number of rows. As you ask for more metrics, it doesn't necessarily increase the number of rows, it increases the number of columns. Each metric is a column. But when you ask for a broken out dimension, what it does is it fights against an aggregation function like sum, sum everything that you know happened for this keyword for the day well no you don't want everything for that keyword that keyword led to different urls so yeah it's okay break it out by path that's a dimension so the number of rows expand because that keyword had led to a number of different urls so you get it broken out to as many urls that that keyword had led traffic to within a certain threshold and uh, you can say, oh, well, I'm interested in mobile versus uh, desktop and also for the URL. So when you add a dimension, you can take away a prior dimension to see the split between mobile and desktop for that keyword. So you can say for this keyword, here's how much traffic was sent to you for this day on the mobile platform. Here's how much traffic was sent to you for that day on the desktop platform. And then roll up all the URLs uh, by just not asking at for path as a broken out dimension. But, you know, uh, it depends on what you're going to do with the data on your end. If you want as much resolution, if you want as much detail as possible, you include all the dimensions in the request and you get a lot of rows and then you step through as many rows as it's willing to give you, storing them down page to rows, right? Pagination of result sets, blah, 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 blah. And uh, pointers or cursors stepping through these result sets. Boy, there's so many. Lean change cheaters on this island. Well, I won't sweat that. Next exit is my exit. I am clearly caught in not rush hour traffic, I guess it's construction traffic. Lunchtime, Monday after a weekend, construction traffic on the highway. Uh, small price to pay for having my kid for that one extra night over. Um, yeah, yeah. So, even doing these uh, API tricks with Google is, is a real trick. Google is uh, makes it harder and harder by locking down on authentication types more and more. My favorite authentication type, which is a web copy paste token, uh, has gone away. Or for all intents and purposes, it has gone away. If you want to continue using it, you have to uh, put your app, which has to be registered, if you want to use OAuth, Google Authentication, your app needs to be registered on the Google Cloud Platform site. So you register it as a project, you choose its authentication type, and uh, if you want to use the, uh, the token, the copy-paste web authentication tokens uh, that has allowed me to so effectively use OAuth over the years, you've got to keep your app, your project, in 
development mode, not in production mode. You have to take it out of production, say it's still in development, and you have to provide an explicit whitelisted set of Google logins that are allowed to use the app. And that's what I'm doing now in OAuth, one of my favorite libraries that I released into the Python Packaging Index, PyPy, P PYPI.org has become significantly less useful. Basically, no one can use it except for a small list of white mailed email addresses I provide now. Now, people can go rewiring it to their own, you know, in developer mode, whitelisted set of email addresses under their own Google search, con under their own Google Cloud Platform login. And I guess I do encourage people to do that, and it's not unreasonable. And it gets you an operation for doing your own sort of, you know, Jupyter, uh, Jupyter Notebook, Jupyter Lab-based uh, investigations that require OAuth. But I'm not entirely happy with that, and I think one of my next steps might be to um, create a, a better OAuth login experience on my LXD Win project and, you know, set things up so it's, like, ready to go. Like, if people want to do LXD Win and have their own local instance of a Jupyter Lab uh, server, just like installing Jupyter Lab desktop or even just like installing Anaconda, it's just another approach to it that uses WSL, the Windows subsystem for Linux, in combination with Linux containers, the LXD Linux container system to give you a system in a bottle better than a Docker one because you can go in and do anything you want to it without worrying about kooky laws of uh, persistence and um, compositing and strange uh, space restrictions. Docker keeps you on a very tight leash, which it should for its purpose. But when your purpose as a developer is to not be kept on a tight leash, uh, Docker can be rather uh, frustrating. So uh, we use LXD instead. And so that's where I'm at right now. Anyone following along? Uh, M I K L E V I N L E V dot I N, Mike Lev dot I N slash U X. Mike Lev. Dot in slash ux and uh, that uh, will start the process of getting you young little personal Linux server uh, running Jupyter uh, that you can log into and do your thing. Follow along with me and uh, gain yourself some awesome powers. So thanks. Talk to you soon. Don't forget to subscribe.